Hello, good people of the internet. John Perry here. I am the creator of the Stated Clearly YouTube channel, and today is Darwin's birthday, and so I'm doing another Darwin Day special. Now, normally, I try to get out and do a talk somewhere and record that for you, but it's COVID, so I'm going to be doing this from my own office, from my house today. Hope you don't mind. Behind me, I've got a drawing of Chuck himself which I made, I drew that back in 2010 when I first decided that I wanted to teach evolution. Uh, I drew that while thinking about how I'd do it. I wanted to, you know, make a career shift. And stated clearly was the idea that I came up with while I was drawing that picture. And just to kind of celebrate this, it's Darwin Day, and, you know, it's been many years since I started this channel. I just put a, a version of that, a poster version of that drawing in the store on YouTube's little store there. So if you want, you can support the channel and get a cool Darwin poster. This talk is actually pre-recorded. I did that just, you know, I like to pre-record things before I put them on the Stated Clearly channel. But I do have a live question and answer session, which will start after this video is over. And there's a link to that in the video description. That's on my second YouTube channel, the Stated Casually YouTube channel. A lot of people I noticed don't know that I have a second channel. So yeah, go over there and subscribe to Stated Casually if you have not already. And you know, I, I made that channel because doing animations takes forever. And I wanted to have a place where I could upload more frequently. I'm currently doing at least once a week over there. Actually, I've been doing twice a week over there. So if you want more biology stuff, subscribe to the Stated Casually YouTube channel. And that is where we will have the live question and answer session after this broadcast. So today's talk, lecture, whatever you want to call it, is can we test the theory of evolution? I've noticed since I started teaching evolution on the internet that there are a lot of people that are very skeptical of the theory of evolution. They don't want to just trust scientists who tell them that evolution is legitimate. And, you know, say what you want about the doubters, people who doubt experts, but that really is, you know, doubt, <laughs> suspicion. This is actually an important part of science. The, the Royal Society, their logo is, or their, their slogan is, nullius in verba, which means take no one's word for it. People who are skeptical of evolution are following that advice. They're trying to, they want to take no one's word for it. And so the, the question that I want to address today is, can we actually test evolution on our own? Like, even at home during COVID-19 lockdown, can we test evolution ourselves and actually see whether or not it's a good theory? This theory that Darwin uh, produced so many years ago now? And the answer is yes. But how? How is it that we go about doing that? This here is Imre Lakatos. I like saying his name. He's Hungarian. He, uh, he's a philosopher of science. He came after like Popper and, and those guys. He talks a lot about how to best test a theory and he really focuses in on research programs. If you want to test a theory, what you need to do is build a research program. You use the theory to make testable hypotheses, and then you go out and you try to test those hypotheses. You go out into the world, you, you test those. And if the theory that you're testing, you're studying, is a good theory, many or even all of those hypotheses should end up leading you to new information. You should be, those hypotheses should be proven to be correct. And the reason that you can't usually just test a theory directly is, you know, a theory like evolution is an extremely broad, overarching theory. And it's actually hard to directly test the theory itself just because it's so big. People have talked about ways to falsify evolution. It's certainly possible to think of things that would falsify the theory of evolution if those things happen to be true. But it, but it is pretty difficult to really directly test a theory as broad as evolution. So he says, use the theory to design a research program, make testable hypotheses, go out into the world and test those hypotheses. And that might seem a little bit abstract. Don't worry, I'm gonna give you some concrete examples. I actually did this uh, when I first started learning about evolution, I actually tested my own hypotheses for the same reason that a lot of people want to test the theory of evolution themselves. A lot of people who are writing me. I was told when I was very young that the theory of evolution was wrong 
Not only was it wrong, but I was told that scientists were going to try to trick me into thinking that it was correct. I learned this at Sunday school. And when I first learned about the theory of evolution, I was very curious. I, I wanted to understand it. Before you can test a theory, you have to really understand it. So that's the first step. Actually know what it is that you're testing. A lot of people who, you know, you'll see, you know, anti-evolution blogs where people are talking about, oh, it's evolution has to be false because of this and this and this. Uh, more often than not, they don't understand the theory of evolution. They're seeing things in nature that don't mix with their fake version of the theory of evolution that they have in their head. And they think that they've like somehow debunked the theory of evolution. In order to really test the theory, you have to understand it first. And I was aware of this. I was 12 years old when I first learned about evolution. It was from a, a, a documentary by David Attenborough. So, I mean, I had, I had learned about it at, at church, but the first science educator that taught me about evolution was David Attenborough. And the things that he was saying, they made sense, but I was very skeptical. You know, I thought he was one of these bad guys that's going to try and teach me bad things and get me to believe a bad theory. So I wanted to find a way to kind of test this on my own. And the first test that I came up with was based on something that I had noticed years earlier. We got a dog when I was probably five years old. His name's Chester, little, little furball. And he was like my best buddy. I, I love this guy. I spent a lot of time with him. Before Chester, you know, my, I, we didn't have pets. I would play with bugs and stuff in the backyard. So I noticed a lot of things about bug anatomy playing with them. And then I started paying pretty close attention to my dog's anatomy. And one of the really cool things that I noticed is that his skeleton is almost exactly like mine. And there were a bunch of really cool things about this. That I noticed that he has this backwards looking knee sort of thing. It wasn't actually a knee, that was his heel bone that dogs walk on their tiptoes. And I noticed that his back legs are attached to hip bones, just like mine are. And his front legs, surprisingly, were attached to shoulder blades, just like my arms are. And so I realized that my dog's front legs are the same as my arms. That was really weird. And so when I learned about evolution from David Attenborough, watching this nature show, that was the first thing that I thought about. And I thought, okay, if, if, if I want to test this theory... I don't want to just trust what David Attenborough is telling me. I don't really trust this supposed expert. What I could do is I could make a prediction. So I know that I have hips and shoulder blades. My dog has hips and shoulder blades. If evolution is true, maybe the reason that I and my dog both have shoulder blades and hips is because the common ancestor of all mammals had hips and had shoulder blades. And we just inherited that through, you know, a historical accident, if you will. And so what I did is I opened up the encyclopedia and I looked around for, you know, I, I looked at skeletons of different animals in the encyclopedia. And what I found was that in fact, all mammals, they have shoulder blades in the front and they have hips in the back. So this is actually a picture I took at the Natural History Museum in Oxford. And you've got, you know, we've got, a, I think that's a lion in the front there on the left. You got some sort of a pig there, uh, tapir with a crazy looking nose. And, and you've got a giraffe in the back. All of them have the same basic body plan and the shoulder blades in front and the hips in back. And I noticed this, you know, when I was younger, I didn't have internet back then. I noticed this in the encyclopedia. And that, of course, wasn't, you know, that wasn't a total confirmation of the theory of evolution, right? That was just one thing, one testable hypothesis and one confirmation of the testable hypothesis. But it gave me confidence in the theory of evolution, a little bit of confidence in the theory of evolution. But it was, of course, possible that maybe there's a reason aside from common ancestry that animals have these shoulder blades in front and hips in the back. And so, uh, you know, as the years went on, I continued thinking about evolution. I, I continued trying to make little hypotheses and, uh, you know, testing those hypotheses. And the, the next big one, if you really have been following my work lately on both of my channels, you probably heard me talk about this before. The, the next big prediction that I made had to do with stingers in bees. I had captured a bug in the backyard, a Katie did, 
And on the back of that Katie did, there was a long stinger-like structure. And I freaked out and I like dropped the thing on the ground because I didn't want to get stung. I had been stung by bees before, right? I was in high school at the time. I went to my biology teacher. I asked my biology teacher, uh, do Katie dids have stingers? And he said, no, but they do have ovipositors. Females have ovipositors. And what they do is they stab into the ground and they lay their eggs with these ovipositors. So ovo is egg and depositor, egg depositor. These are egg depositors. So here's a photograph of a Katie did stabbing the ground and, you know, laying eggs in the ground. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, I wonder if a bee's stinger is a modified ovipositor because the ovipositor looks a lot like a stinger, right? It excretes eggs. And I, I also read about it in a bit and they also excrete little fluids that uh, help protect the eggs. And I thought, well, maybe since, you know, bees don't, uh, most worker bees don't lay eggs anymore. Maybe they, there's the fluid that would come out of the ovipositor. Maybe that had transformed over evolutionary time. It evolved to become a venom-like fluid. And so the, the, you know, you turned a reproductive organ into a weapon. And to test that hypothesis, I, I, I asked, do male bees have stingers? And I was able to look that up in the encyclopedia. Now, again, these are not new discoveries to science, but they were new discoveries to me. I didn't know these things. I predicted them based on the theory of evolution. I looked them up and sure enough, they were true. Male bees do not have stingers. I looked even further. I, internet was around at this time and I learned that actually scientists classify the bee stinger as a modified ovipositor. And if you look at the history of its evolution, it actually, well, here, okay, here's a close-up of a stinger, of a, of a queen bee actually laying an egg, and she's using the stinger. It's kind of hard to see. She, she's actually using her stinger um, kind of as a finger to move it around inside of the, the egg chamber. So she doesn't, the stinger, the egg doesn't come out of the stinger in bees, but they do use the stinger to help deposit eggs. Even still, the queen bee does. She can actually sting with it too. Her sting is not quite as bad as the, the worker bee's sting. I've highlighted the stinger in yellow here so you can see it. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture. The male bees do not have stingers. And it turns out that the, the venom in a stinger appears to have evolved in the earlier ancestors of bees, which were doing what wasps still do today. Uh, they were, would lay eggs inside of living animals. And so the, the venom evolved to help with this, to subdue their victims. This is a caterpillar that's being stung by a wasp who is then going to lay her eggs in that wasp. And here is a clip of eggs hatching out of a caterpillar. So that is horrible. We now have two hypotheses that I was able to make based on the theory of evolution. I was able to go out into nature, well, read about <laughs> nature, and learn that in fact, these predictions are correct. I was actually using the theory of evolution to make testable predictions and those predictions were true. And this, this, this actually, this, this ovipositor one was the thing that really, really knocked it home for me. Like, okay, evolution is a thing. This is completely legitimate. But just this week, this happened to me again. I made another prediction and I tested that prediction and I wanted to share that with you. And for this, I actually still have, I saved my browser windows. So my brand new discovery, new to me, not new to science, just new to me, was made, it started out by just me scrolling around on Instagram. This is an account called Tardy Babe by Chloe. And she does, makes a lot of videos with her microscope and they're amazing. And you definitely, if you are on Instagram, you need to go there and subscribe to Tardy Babe's Instagram or follow it or whatever they call it. Uh, her stuff is amazing. Look at this, just beautiful. She makes these beautiful films. Look at that, she's posting all the time. She always says something cool about him too. She teaches you what's going on and she keeps it fun. And so just every day, pretty much every day she posts something. So I've got this constant flow of, you know, microscopic organisms in my Instagram feed, and it's the coolest thing ever. Amazing videos. Let me zoom in a little bit here. 
just uh, <laughs> so cool. But I was scrolling through Instagram. This one's really neat. It looks like a landscape. I'm scrolling through Instagram and I find, let's see if I can find it here. This one right here. It's an amoeba just moving around, doing its thing. She's got it, it's sped up, so this is times at 2.5 speed. And I just started thinking about amoebas. You know, I had learned about amoebas in college and in high school. And I learned, I learned about white blood cells in college and in high school, but I hadn't thought about the connection between amoebas and white blood cells before. Maybe someone had mentioned it in one of my classes. But I was just, I was watching this and I was just amazed at how similar this is to a white blood cell in a human. And I don't, I don't have any footage of white blood cells, but if you look it up, you'll, you'll see it, it, we basically make amoebas. We make our own amoebas that hang out in our blood and travel around and they eat pathogens. And this amoeba is a free living, essentially a free living white blood cell that just goes around and eats pathogens and reproduces on its own. It eats, it eats bacteria and it eats, I don't know, they eat all sorts of things, algae and, and stuff. And I started thinking about how weird this is that we can make our own amoebas. We make them. The amoeba cells, the white blood cells that we have, they have the same DNA that we have in all of our other cells. It's just that, you know, you know the, the skin cell genes are turned off and the amoeba cell genes are turned on. That's, we've got all the genes there. Every cell in your body has the same DNA. They just use it differently to create different body forms. And I thought, okay, if evolution is true <laughs> and we can make our own amoebas, I wonder how far back this goes. I bet you that the first animals had this ability to make body cells and amoeba-like cells that were free swimming, free, kind of free living organisms inside their bodies. And I'm trying to think, okay, well, what, is the, what is the furthest possible animal on the evolutionary tree from humans that's, that still exists today? The most distant relative that's still considered an animal? Well, that would be the sea sponge. I didn't know if sea sponges could make amoeba cells, but I looked it up. I looked up amoeboid movement in sponge cells. This is my Google search. And the first thing that Google told me is that I misspelled movement. So thank you, Google. I now know how to spell movement correctly. <laughs> and then I, I found this article right here, which had some really cool little drawings of sponge cells. And sure enough, right there, we have the body cells of the sponge and we have amoebocytes. So <laughs> sponges can make amoeba cells. These amoebas, they have the same DNA as the other sponge cells, but they are in amoeba form. So these sponges, their DNA can produce these round cells with the, uh, with the flagella and the cilia, the little collars, and they can also produce amoebas. So this, sure enough, evolution for the win, I was able to make an accurate prediction about nature. It gets cooler than this though. This is not this is not the full story. I went and I found this this paper. This is from like 1920s or something. 1923. Yep, 1923. And it's called the amoeboid movement of dissociated sponge cells. And what this guy did, Paul Galtsif, he he took sponges and ground them up. He actually he he pushed them through a, like a wire mesh to separate all the cells. Just you know massacred these sponges and what would happen is you know there's all these different cell types there's there are some cell types that have flagella there are some cell types that are just kind of like our skin cells where they're just globs that uh you know stick to each other and there are these amoeba like cells and what he notice is that when you push it through a wire mesh and you break everything apart the cells that have flagella will swim and find each other and they'll start to form a structure again and the cells that could not move like amoebas will transform and they will start moving like amoebas and they will try and find each other. And then the cells that already moved like amoebas, well, they just, they find each other by moving around like an amoeba, as you would expect. So that was really cool. Not only do sponges make amoeba cells, their normal cells can actually transform into amoeba-like cells. 
This got me thinking even further. Okay, so if evolution is true, <laughs> sponges should be able to produce amoeba cells. Oh, look, they can. Go figure. Well, but also I, I would bet that the ability for a cell to transform from, you know, a round cell to an amoeba-like cell or a, a, a cell with a, uh, with a flagella to an amoeba cell, I'd bet that that ability existed before animals were animals. Back when animals, the ancestors of animals were just single-celled creatures, I bet you that they could transform from a flagella to an amoeba type structure. And I'm thinking, what are the closest single-celled organisms that are related to animals? And that, of course, is the cyanoflagellates. These are the single-celled organisms most closely related to animals. We figure this through DNA, but also through their structure and their behavior. They can actually form clusters, multi-celled clusters, and they like to do this. And they actually do a little bit of cellular differentiation. So they'll, they'll actually divide and conquer. They'll, well, they'll end up performing different tasks when they form a structure. So they kind of behave like sponges. They form these clusters and then they, they morphologically change when they form these structures. Okay, cool. My question was, can these things turn from things with flagella to things that move around like amoebas? So I did a Google search. <laughs> I typed in amoeboid movement, and I spelled movement correctly this time, amoeboid movement in coanoflagellates. And I found the very first result is this PDF. And so if you download the PDF, well, it takes you to this page. Download the PDF, <laughs> open that up, and you scroll down to the pictures, because screw reading all this. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling for many pages. Oh, there we go. So I actually did read it too, but what happens is this guy found that if you take a coanoflagellate and you pinch it, so you make it so that uh, you don't smash it, but you, you make it so that it cannot swim using its flagella. You just pinch it, he was pinching it between pieces of glass. What happens is if you pinch it just enough so that you don't hurt it, it will try and swim to get loose. And if it can't get loose, it actually absorbs its own flagella. It transforms into an amoeba <laughs> and it uses amoeboid movement to crawl around on the glass until it gets out of the glass. And then it redevelops its flagella and it turns back into a, a coanoflagellate. <laughs> like this is amazing. This is spectacular. Just using the theory of evolution, I made this prediction that sea sponges should be able to make amoeba cells. That led me to a further question. <laughs> should coanoflagellates be able to transform into amoeba cells? And then I just, yes, they can. I just looked it up and yes, <laughs> someone had already figured this out. Someone already did all of this research. This is amazing. The theory of evolution will lead you to new information. It is what Lakatos called a progressive theory. It is constantly leading scientists to new discoveries about reality, and it can constantly lead you to new discoveries about reality. It doesn't matter if those discoveries have already been discovered by somebody else. They're new to you, and you will come upon them by just using the theory of evolution. So let me just kind of recap this real quick. If you want to test the theory of evolution for yourself in your own home, the first thing you need to do is learn what the theory of evolution is. And, uh, you know, you can do that by, there's a, there's a playlist for the Stated Clearly videos on the theory of evolution. You can watch that, start by watching that. Once you have a good grasp of how the theory works, you can just start creating hypotheses and then going out and testing those. And you can go out and test them in the wild. Go out in the field like a true scientist and, and do it. Or you can actually just cheat by Googling and uh, testing things for yourself. And the cool thing about this is that you don't have to trust experts. If you don't trust, if, if, you, if you are suspicious, you think that maybe they might be trying to trick you, that's okay. It is true that an expert did this experiment on the amoeba or on the uh, coanoflagellates. But they weren't doing this to test my hypothesis about evolution. They were just doing this because they thought it was interesting. Like, you know, is this possible? This was me testing the theory of evolution myself. I did not have to trust anyone to do this. And you can do the same. You can come to your own conclusions about this. So I think that's wonderful. Chuck, 
Charles Darwin, thank you for the incredible discovery you made. Thank you for putting this together in that book, The Origin of Species. It revolutionized the world. It has definitely given me hours and hours of entertainment <laughs> and helped me uh, discover incredible new things. I appreciate it. Happy birthday. And everybody, please remember that I have an open Q&A session that's going on on the Stated Casually channel, and I will actually be there live to answer your questions in real time. It's a live broadcast, and there is a link to that down in the video description, so check that out if you want to learn more. If you've got some questions that you have from watching this video, I will be there to answer your questions. So long for now. Stay curious.